Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for waiting. We're going to continue on the Warriors Corner. Please give a warm welcome for Brigadier General Jeffrey Johnson and Dr. Colleen Rye. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. How are you all? This is my best uh, North Carolina piece I can bring up. Uh, appreciate everybody uh, being here to talk a little bit about virtual health. Uh, we're going to break this 40-minute uh, period into three different sections. Uh, we're going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, some of the history and some of the strategic level aspects of virtual health. We're then going to uh, talk a little bit about what are we doing on the operational perspective. How are we meeting the warfighters' needs? And then uh, at the end, we'll have a bit of a demo uh, to show you a little bit of what uh, virtual health looks like as it might be applied uh, across uh, the globe, to be honest with you. And so I uh, appreciate everybody uh, being here and uh, your attention. Uh, as a physician, uh, over the course of my 28-year career, uh, I believe that virtual health is really at the water sh is a watershed moment for us. Uh, I've been in uh, long enough to be able to see a complete change in how we use tourniquets, how we uh, resuscitate in a hypo hypovolemic state, uh, how we use advanced blood clotting factors. All of those things have influenced survivability on the battlefield. I truly believe that all of those will pale when it comes to how virtual health changes the way that uh, Army medicine gets after taking care of our patients and meeting our warfighter requirements. And hopefully you'll be able to get a, a bit of that today uh, from this presentation. So the question would be, uh, where are we going to limit ourselves here to talk? Because virtual health is really a very large uh, piece to get after. And there are applications on the garrison side, or as many of you might uh, look at it, on the, on the health industry side. And then there's applications on the operational side. We're only going to uh, talk today about the operational side. And so if you want to talk about how does a hospital take care of uh, patients uh, inside of a major metropolitan area, that's for a different time. Uh, today it's going to be all about how do we extend ourselves uh, on the battlefield. Uh, so. My first question, just to set the stage a little bit for you, would be why do we care about virtual health? Why, why does it really matter? And I'd like for you to think about that in relationship or informed by the multi-domain battle. We've seen and heard about what that battlefield of the future looks like, and I think we need to take those same cues from our warfighters inside of Army Medicine and understand how do we need to adapt and to change. What happens when we don't have evacuation readily present? If evacuation is completely denied, it then forces us to figure out how do we do prolonged field care? How do we manage more complex types of problems down at a smaller level? We talk about the multi-domain battle is going to have many dispersed units that are going to have to be rapidly mobile. Understand that that means you're not going to have a doctor in every setting. How do you extend the reach of Army medicine across the globe to meet the warfighters' needs with the assets that we have? That, to me, is that watershed piece that we're now quickly approaching to figure out how we support the warfighter. So with that, let me introduce uh, Dr. Colleen Rye. She heads Army Virtual Medicine at MedCom headquarters. And she's going to give us a bit of a strategic uh, overview of what uh, virtual medicine looks like. And then I'll come back and uh, give you some more uh, after she's finished. Colleen. All right. Thanks so much, General Johnson. Uh, it's really an honor to be here with you today to tell you a little bit more about uh, where we've been in Army Virtual Health, uh, where we are now, and then a glimpse into the future of where we're going, particularly with the Virtual Medical Center. If we could go to the next slide. We're really so fortunate to be uh, on the shoulders of giants here in Army Virtual Health and have expertise over at least the last 20 years in virtual health modalities. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment, but just to give you a snapshot, we are currently, today, doing virtual health in 18 time zones, over 30 countries and territories, and over 30 clinical specialties. And that's really when you compare us in telehealth systems across the world. Uh, we are not the largest, but we are certainly the most geographically widespread um, because that's where we need to be. Um, why do we do this? It's because of readiness. That's all of our number one priority. 
And when you can take a soldier and do sick call virtually, well, that's wonderful. Those are hours and sometimes days that you can now put back into training, and that means readiness. Um, you know, what about when you can actually reach a warfighter, you know, at the point of need and the point of injury? We're starting to do that, and we'll talk more about that. That's readiness. Uh, that's an evacuation avoided. Uh, that's somebody who can stay there in the fight. We're certainly not doing this alone. We have many collaborative partnerships uh, with civilian organizations, other government organizations um, that, are, that are helping make this um, possible. And within Army Medicine, we really have an engaged and energetic team from research uh, out at Tatrick with Colonel Dan Crawl, who's with us today, uh, to our, our new virtual medical center, uh, to the team at OTSG. So uh, we're very excited about where we're moving forward. You can go to the next slide. So our current phase of expansion is within the context of the 2017 National Defense Authorization Act. Uh, there is a section, Section 718, that actually mandates comprehensive virtual health expansion. And we are doing this in Army Medicine within the garrison setting, um, but also within the operational deployed setting to support the warfighter. Next slide. Stepping back a moment into our history, um, you know, this shows our timeline against encounter volume since 1992. And you can see really 1992 to the 2010 timeframe, we had a really fruitful period of expansion, um, uh, but mostly centered on pilots. So some sense making. What, what can we do with this new technology? Where is it going to help us? Are there new things we can develop in our research labs? Um, many of those having gone to the civilian network now. And by 2010, we really got to the point where we knew that we wanted to put some money into it and we wanted to institutionalize it. And that's when we set up the telehealth office within the Army Surgeon General's office. And uh, our first mission was to build three global telebehavioral health hubs. We strategically located them across the world so that we had 24 by 7 by 365 coverage. And as, as a great example, after the Fort Hood shooting, we were there immediately, but virtually, with mental health assets, psychiatrists and psychologists who never left their desk in Hawaii, Texas, and D.C., but were supporting folks at Fort Hood, Texas, freeing up the psychologists and psychiatrists on the ground to do the walk-arounds. And so that's an example of emergency support, but we also learned a lot about how to uh, support in, uh, in uh, kind of normal everyday care as well. With the, with the stand-up of those and the funding of those, we moved into a period of operational standardization and really preparations for this next great step, uh, which we'll tell you about today. Next slide. So this is where we're at today, about 40,000 encounters a year. Uh, what does that include? That includes a doctor in uh, Brook Army Medical Center reaching out via video and providing care to a patient somewhere. Uh, somewhere in the world, be a garrison or a deployed environment. It also includes, say, a primary care doc reaching out for pulmonology expertise or hematology expertise, um, you know, to, to really support the provider to provider. What it does not include are things like telepharmacy, teleradiology, secure messaging, which would bring it north of 10 million encounters per year uh, and bring it in line with how our civilian counterparts count it. So the narrow view, but also the broader view of what we're currently doing. Next slide. So just one more visual in the context. You see what we're doing here in fiscal 11. We could do next slide. This is our airline map for fiscal 17. And so clearly we're broadening our connections, we're broadening our scope, and I fully anticipate that by this time next year, We'll start reaching out to see the Africa and South America and all the places where we have deployed uh, troops. Next slide. And, and we'll do this through the Virtual Medical Center. Uh, General Johnson will take you through uh, the Virtual Medical Center and its mission next. But just very briefly, this is our operational level hub and our synchronizing element for the tactical level efforts in virtual health across, uh, across Army medicine. We're very excited. Um, we went through a nine-month evaluation process uh, with stakeholders across the G staff, and uh, we couldn't be more excited with BMC uh, going forward as the VMC. Next slide. 
just want to give you a few vignettes of what we're doing uh, to support the warfighter here. And this is prepping for the next phase of expansion to the battlefield. And, and, and one great one, I think, is, is our support to NATO uh, in, in, in support of the strong Europe. Uh, we have, for the last two years, provided um, virtual health expertise to rotational forces. And so we're sending out some of, the, um, some of the portable suitcases you'll see, some of the larger telehealth carts, and we're connecting soldiers back to Longstall for whatever type of specialty expertise that they might need. And this is one of the many ways in which we're keeping folks in the fight, you know, within the rotational forces and not having to bring them back uh, for, for every medical need. If we go to uh, number two, our USASOC telementoring, this is a neat pilot. We um, have not begun this yet. We're still in the planning phases. But I want you to really sit back and imagine that you are 20 years old, you're uh, a medic, or, or perhaps you're a young MD, and you are somewhere in a safe house with a soldier, maybe two, who have casualties, and one's going downhill pretty rapidly. Um, you've radioed in, you're not going to get an AIRVAC for 72 hours. And this is becoming much more commonplace in places like Africa uh, and some of the other places we are now deployed. What will you do? Well, what if we had sent out with you a telemedicine kit like the one that you'll see shortly? And what if we could real-time video stream along with, with kind of holographic augmented reality glasses and the surgeon's arms could come into your field of vision surgeon who, by the way, is probably in Texas, and say, cut there, don't cut there. Here's exactly what you need to do to stabilize the soldier until we can get a bird in and get him out. This is where we're partnering with Special Forces. Uh, we're very excited about this. We think it has a lot of potential. Um, just as, as one more, if we could hop down to uh, number five, teleconsultations for deployed providers. Um, you know, say you are deployed to a dark green scary place, your primary care, you've got a soldier in front of you with a rash that you've never seen, uh, fever started to go pretty high, uh, maybe there's some GI complaints, and you're really not sure what it is. Well, we're Army Medicine. We are deployed in every time zone in the world. Why in the world can you not get the next available dermatologist to look at you? Why can't you bring an infectious disease? Maybe you need GI. And this is exactly what we've been doing for the past nine years through the PATH program in the Pacific. Um, the Navy liked it so much, we executed an agreement, we built out a section for them, and now it's on uh, at least 70 ships. And we're now working with Navy, Air Force, and within our own formation uh, to build a one portal so that every provider in military medicine is connected with every other provider all the time, everywhere. What a beautiful thing. This is really going to take us to the next level. Next slide. I just want to uh, conclude here by giving a visual for one of our recent successes in the field. This is with the 5th Special Forces group. Uh, it was a collaboration between 5th uh, Special Forces, Blanchfield, and Eisenhower. And, and essentially, we, we weren't sure where they were, um, but they were deployed. And they came in and radioed a call and said, look, we've got our deployable medical kit, there's been a casualty, we need immediate hand surgery. Now, if you know anything about hand surgery, this can be a very, very um, delicate operation, or you're gonna lose some nerve function, things aren't gonna work right. And so within a minute and a half, we had connected the special forces with a hand surgeon at Eisenhower. Uh, we had a nurse back at Campbell who was helping with the operation, and uh, that soldier is fine today. Hand is fine, everything's 100% functional um, because of the power of bringing together three locations, one of which we didn't even know where it was. Um, this is kind of really a thought picture of where we're moving uh, in Army medicine. So I'd actually like to, um, to conclude this portion now and uh, introduce uh, General uh, Jeff Johnson, Commanding General, Brooke Army Medical Center. Okay, so uh, I'm back. Uh Appreciate everybody uh, just kind of thinking about what's taking place at the large picture. Hopefully we've whetted your appetite a bit about what uh, applications could be applied. My job now is really to try to put this into context. Uh, so let me uh, just use a quick vignette. 
Uh, I'm a family physician. I'm at a tactical operations center inside of Afghanistan. Uh, there's a uh, foot patrol that's taking place uh, up in the Korangal. Uh, that foot patrol is uh, then called out to become the QRF for uh, troops in contact. In order for them to get to where they need to go, uh, they need to scale a mountain and uh, drop over to the other side to uh, assist. In the process of that uh, platoon scaling the mountain, one of their soldiers goes down. I hear that on the radio. It's one-way conversation. The medic approaches the downed soldier, is wondering what's going on here. Is this a heat injury? Is there something else that's taking place? Uh, begins to try to figure out uh, how to get vital signs, those kinds of things. And the, the uh, soldier then begins to have a seizure. The medic's now trying to figure out, holy cow, this is, uh, this is more than what I'm normally used to seeing. What do I do here? Obviously, the whole platoon has now stopped in their ability to support the mission that they were given. The medic's now struggling to figure out, do I give IV fluid? Do I give PO fluids? Uh, do I use some of this medication I have in my backpack in order to stop this seizure? And over the course of the radio, I now hear the medic saying, I think uh, I'm having trouble with the airway. I need to do a surgical airway. Pretty significant uh, event. So my question really is, what's informing the medic to be able to help them in that kind of scenario? And what's informing the platoon leader for the platoon leader to make a decision about, do I need to stop the patrol and use all of my assets now to take this patient out? Because unfortunately, they were above the level that a UH-60 could fly in for medevac. So my question is, what informs them? I believe that's where virtual health is coming to play and where it is that we're going to be able to then employ somebody like me in an operations center to be able to assist that medic in providing additional care to enhance the utilization of the, uh, the warfighter. If we can go to the next slide. So let me just set this up a little bit. The Virtual Medical Center is the conduit by which we plan to execute uh, virtual health across Army medicine, and to be honest with you, across the Department of Defense. It's designed to provide a streamlined uh, process by which we can synchronize all of the activities that are taking place across the globe inside of virtual health. It is uh, a, a center that has physicians that are trained and understand how to implement the technology that's in front of them, and it also allows for the medics to have additional training in how to uh, inter interact with the providers. As you can see in this slide, there are, uh, the, um, the MedCom is divided up into four regions. You can see uh, Atlantic at the top, uh, Europe on the, bottom, or on the right, uh, Pacific, and then uh, over in Central. Again, the virtual medical center in the middle is designed to be that easy button to allow all of the different activities to work seamlessly. It doesn't matter whether that contact with a provider is in a tactical operations center in Afghanistan or if there's somebody who is in Seattle. Uh, really, that's the purpose of the Virtual Medical Center. If you can go back one slide, sorry. I also just want to talk a little bit on the left-hand side. There's really two aspects of virtual medicine. One is uh, real-time uh, and one is delayed. One is synchronous and one is asynchronous. Let me talk about the asynchronous first at the bottom that you see here. We've been doing this for 20 years. We've been communicating as docs using telephones, using email, and now using text to be able to get answers to difficult questions that we have. That's a part of virtual medicine. That's a part that will continue to amplify as we move forward. But the part to me that's really exciting is the, or is the synchronous piece, which is the real time. So let me just talk about remote health monitoring. What's the application on the battlefield? Many of you are familiar with a forward surgical team. The way we uh, currently uh, use them is that we split them in half, and it's a 10-member team that's able to accomplish uh, real-time surgeries. So transport yourself to Naray, Afghanistan. There's a 10-member team that uh, has uh, four critical uh, urgent surgical patients brought into them. The first person has their uh, immediate uh, surgery done, and they're put into the post-op area. The 10 people are now concentrating on patient number two who needs to get to the operating room and patient three and four who now 
need to figure out how to get pre-opt. What happens to patient one? They typically are in the back of the forward surgical team, maybe with a medic uh, who is trying to figure out how do I monitor some critical uh, vital signs and some other indications for how, the, how this patient is doing. Via re remote health monitoring, we can connect that patient back to uh, Europe, back to CONUS, back to the Pacific, in order to highlight to that team where there's some predictable vital sign changes that are identifying that this patient's about ready to go downhill. How does that impact that forward surgical team? How does that impact the lives saved that we can have inside the forward surgical teams? So just one example of the, of the uh, synchronous virtual health uh, opportunities that are there. Also, the M Health that you see uh, as the fourth pillar there, that's really how do you connect virtual health to this kind of device? How do we connect providers to patients where they live, work, and play? Uh, how do we uh, connect them to uh, other remote health monitoring devices, whether that's a scale, whether that's a blood pressure cuff, whether that's a, um, a, a blood glucose monitor? So this is really what the, the virtual medical center looks like. Uh, and uh, to me is a pretty exciting place for us to figure out how do we synchronize all this. Next slide. I just want to briefly uh, reiterate, this, these are the types of uh, places where we see virtual health really uh, beginning to play a role in patients to providers. And you notice here that uh, we see that what we do in garrison is the same as what we do in uh, the operational setting. There's really no difference between the clinic and an aid station. There's no difference between uh, connecting to somebody at work or connecting to them at a motor pool. And so uh, to us, as we train in garrison, this will apply uh, on the operational side as well. Also, uh, providers to, uh, provider to provider, essentially expanding the ability for individuals to be able to expand the kind of patient they're seeing and prevent them from having to move from one location to another. And then the last one you see there is patient to system. And uh, I really described uh, hooking up that bathroom scale uh, inside of your home is really no different than hooking up to some kind of remote ICU monitoring that exists across an ocean. In this virtual health world, there's really no difference between five feet, 25 feet, and 5,000 miles. That's the beauty of what this looks like. Next slide. So, uh, I just wanted to talk about one program that I think is, uh, is, is pretty il illustrative of what it is that we're doing, and it's called ADVISOR. ADVISOR stands for Advanced uh, Virtual Support to Operational Forces. Up on the top right, you can see that this applies to role one, two, and three care that's taking place uh, out in our deployed environments. If you follow uh, that one, role one, two, and three down through a cloud, you can see that if you just have routine issues, we have lots of different ways that we can assist and help in that deployed setting. And uh, through that uh, virtual connection, uh, TCONs, voicemail, uh, messages can be left for uh, a, a, a nephrologist to be able to help out uh, with a, a problem that somebody might be having. The part that I think is, uh, is more uh, uh, advanced and really is gonna have the ability for us to be able to impact the battlefield is really on the uh, urgent and the emergent side. If you follow through, we have a 1-800 number, 1-800 advisor, that uh, immediately connects to a phone tree. Do you need specialty care? Do you need uh, 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 critical care? And allows us to be able to then uh, route you to the right location. Through that virtual, uh, through that phone tree, we then can connect you either emergently uh, to an emergency department. And currently, uh, the emergency departments at Eisenhower, at Brook, and at Madigan are playing uh, in, this, uh, in this support function. You also notice that if you need uh, ICU uh, um, information, if you need ICU coverage, backup, how do, I, uh, how do I deal with the problem that's in front of me? We've already established, uh, both through uh, Army, Army medical treatment facilities as well as through uh, the joint community, of organizations that are on call 24-7 to be able to answer those calls. And you can see those networks are out at San Diego, they're up in uh, Tacoma, uh, Seattle area, they're in San Antonio, and they're in Augusta, Georgia, uh, really allowing us to be able to uh, fulfill the requirement to meet the needs of the uh, warfighter and the individuals on the field. 
So next slide is my last slide, and I just wanted to briefly talk about something called Mobile Medic, and then we're going to do a, a quick demonstration of that. What we've, uh, what we've done is we've trained providers as well as medics uh, to be able to function separated from each other, but connected virtually. And so we have medics who are equipped with some equipment you're going to see here in just a minute that allows them to go anywhere that we want to send them and allows them to be able to assess a patient, develop a plan, and then to connect back to a, uh, a physician to be able to guide them in their treatment plan, which then could result in medications, procedures, blood draws, whatever it might be. So imagine the impact of what that looks like in remote forward operating bases, where a medic might be the most senior person that's there, having to make a decision, should I evacuate this patient, or can I continue to take care of them here at my FOB? So we connect those medics to the, uh, to the providers through something called telehealth in a bag, and it allows them to be able to uh, uh, transmit back all of the information that's needed. And so uh, with that, what I want to do is uh, introduce to you Specialist Rath, who is uh, right behind you. And uh, he's going to connect and demonstrate for you what uh, this looks like uh, from a provider's perspective. Uh, we also are connected back to uh, San Antonio, which will allow uh, Dr. Hip, who you see on the screen now, to be able to direct Specialist Rath in what it is that he would do in a deployed setting. So Dr. Hip, are you able to hear us? Uh, loud and clear, sir. Good to hear All right. you. All right, great. So, Specialist Rath, Dr. Hip, uh, why don't you go ahead and uh, do, uh, do an assessment here of your patient. Excellent. Um, what, what is bothering you right now, Sergeant Major? How about we look into his, his mouth first? All right, so what Specialist Rath is now doing, he's connecting via USB port, a, uh, a device that will allow him to uh, have uh, high resolution uh, visibility of the uh, back of the pharynx. How long has this been going on, Sergeant Major? All right. So some of you might be asking, what's the resolution? Uh, how, how well are you able to be able to see what you want to see? And I will tell you, the resolution that you see here is the same thing that we get, whether that's uh, deployed or not, and more than sufficient in order for us to be able to make some clinical diagnoses or to give some direction on what's taking place. So let me now, uh, Dr. Hip, I'm gonna jump in uh, just to get things moving a little bit faster. We also need to take a look in uh, Sergeant Major's ear. If you could just uh, demonstrate what that looks like. <laughs> well, the back of your throat looked pretty good. I didn't see any infection back there, Sergeant Major, just to comfort you. So just be aware, Dr. Hip's a pediatric hematology oncologist, so I wouldn't trust what he thinks the back of the throat looks like. Always a pediatrician, sir. So oh, look at that tympanic man. Perfect. So once again, nice glossy uh, being able to picture. make a diagnosis based on the type of resolution that you have here, uh, pretty easy to do regardless of where you are. Uh, just needing an internet connection. And then we're just going to finish here. Uh, how about if we take a listen to uh, maybe uh, Sergeant Major's heart just to demonstrate another USB activated uh, gadget that allows us to be able to uh, complete an additional exam. There are also other USB uh, devices uh, that allow you to transmit an EKG. Uh, also, uh, ultrasound capability uh, to be able to uh, do further exams should they be needed.
So bear with us a little bit. It's more clunky here, actually, trying to get it to go through the multiple audiovisual systems. All right. So yeah, sour majors don't really have heart. Go ahead, Specialist Wrath. Put it on you. Put it on you. I think you're a little more nervous. So again, uh, breast sounds, uh, a cardiac exam, those kinds of things, all within the grasp to inform a provider who is virtually connected to our mobile medics. So let me just conclude here and then give you a chance to ask some questions. Uh, Army Medicine is absolutely ensuring access, regardless of where it is around the world that our warfighters want to conduct business. That's a big issue because we currently have many operational decisions that are limited by where it is that medics can support them. Hopefully you've been able to see through this small demonstration that we have an ability to expand where it is that we're connecting uh, the right provider with the right patient at the right time to make operationally relevant decisions. We also believe that virtual health is going to save lives. It's going to impact on how it is that we care for patients once we have them uh, in front of a medic. But more importantly, I think this is going to be something that our warfighters are going to be able to use to operationalize the way that they do business so that we can better get after the mission sets that we have inside the multi-domain battle. So with that, uh, pause to hear any questions that you might have, either for myself, Dr. Rai, Specialist Rath is always worth uh, lots, of, uh, lots of points as well to ask a question there. Sir, John Osborne, U.S. Army Africa. Um, first of all, we didn't have any lines going down to Africa, but I can tell you that we've had a lot of interaction with Brooke through the virtual health system uh, that, quite frankly, has saved lives. My question is, from a telementoring standpoint and a credentialing standpoint, if I am, have a soldier who has been fragged in the leg and I know I'm not going to be able to get them out 48, 72 hours or something, even 24 hours. And they're basically presenting with a compartment syndrome. From a credentialing standpoint, you don't have a surgeon on the ground. How are you approaching that? Or is that being discussed and not finished yet? Either one of you. Thank yeah, you. No, appreciate the question, Dr. Osborne. And uh, to be honest with you, I think there's going to be a lot of places that we have to press forward and really look at the policies, the regulations of who it is that can do what uh, at what time. How it is that we have the mentoring piece that's uh, creating the link between the, the provider who's credentialed to do something or licensed to do something and how we have an extender out forward to be able to do those things. So to just take a, a, a pickup game and to take any medic and connect them with any doc is likely to be very problematic. But to have some type of training and relationship that's been set up of if we get in a situation where we don't have any other better options, here's what we can do, I think is really where we're at uh, as we first begin to tackle this problem. Appreciate the question. And just to follow up on that, on that briefly, we're in full partnership with the Joint Commission as we explore these issues. I mean, the USASOC pilot that we discussed, um, you know, that's very much going to be in a research realm uh, to make sure that we do have the space to answer these very important questions. Any more questions? We have five minutes. Um, I know the focus of the discussion today is more on the battlefield and, and for the deployed forces, but is this something that we could see in the future or it is happening um, here in, in CONUS? Is, is this something that will help maybe access to care issues for those that live in rural areas, perhaps? Yeah, we're very much doing that today, and, and today, again, we did focus on the operational piece, um, but, but quite honestly, most of the 40,000 encounters that we talked about are in garrison. Uh, today. And so we have seen great access to care uh, jumps because of this. Uh, you know, readiness to deploy has gone up. Uh, we, we have another program 
um, that essentially takes care of all your um, PHA needs virtually. And so, you know, we've seen, you know, great increases uh, in that as well. So in the same way that we talk about uh, there's needs in the deployed setting at a remote fob, to be honest with you, that's really not any different than if you're at a, uh, a fort camp or station that may or may not have the same level of specialty care there, right? So you see the application, and really, from our perspective, it's wonderful because we can absolutely employ in garrison the same way that we're going to employ during support to the warfighter, and we can enhance care all along all of those lines. So to me, it's a, it's a great news story. Yes, ma'am. In order to enhance their use of telehealth, the Department of the Veterans Affairs recently issued a rule allowing any provider to provide care regardless of whether they're licensed in the receiving state. Did you all have to do anything like that or how have you handled that situation? We, we actually received that exemption in the 2012 NDAA. Um, and for us it came as a, as a part of a legislation. Uh, we were very pleased with that because it really did allow us to extend access and so now you know, we've always been able to go to federal to federal, um, but in 2012, we were then able to go from someone's home in Iowa to a dock in Indiana uh, that has an Alaska license, and, and it's all good. And so that really, um, you know, we're working very closely in partnership with the VA. Uh, we're, we're very pleased to see um, uh, it, it has been very good for us to have that rule. I think we've got time for one more question, if there is one. Great, I appreciate everybody's attention. Thank you very much.